Hello and welcome to our conference today, where we have attendees from many countries. So good afternoon, people in Europe, and good morning in America. I'm Pablo Alifano, General Manager of Talan in Spain, a global firm focused on helping our clients with digital and agile transformation. I would like to present my colleague Raquel Gavilán, who will be moderating this event with me today. Hello, Raquel, how are you? Hi, Pablo, I'm fine. Excellent. Hello, everybody. Uh, let, me, let me introduce myself. I'm Raquel Gavilán, Agile coach focused on HR transformation. And like my team, the business transformation line of Talent Spain, we are passionate about this topic. So thank you, Pablo, and, and thank you, Jürgen. And Excellent. Thank you, Raquel. So I would like to announce our special guest, who honestly does not need much presentation, since I'm sure most of you already know his career and background. Just to highlight some facts, he's a successful entrepreneur, author, and a speaker. He's pioneer in management to help creative organizations survive in the 21st century. He's the author of the book, Management 3.0, which describes the role of the manager in agile organizations. And many other books, such as How to Change the World, Managing for Happiness, and most recently, a Startup, a Scale Up, a Screw Up. He's CEO of business network Happy Melly and co-founder of the Agile Lean Europe Network. I'm glad to welcome Mr. Jürgen Apelo. Hello, Jürgen. Ta-da. Hey, hello, Pablo. Hello, Raquel. How are you? I am pretty good. Thank you so much. Very well. So we, we are very grateful, uh, Jürgen, to have you here. And uh, we can wait to hear your presentation on this event. We have named it Beyond. Agile Transformation, HR as a Driver of Change. There will be a presentation of about 45 minutes, followed by 15 minutes uh, Q&A. So, Jürgen, are you ready to go? I am ready to go, for sure, yeah. So, the floor is yours. All right, awesome. Thank Thanks. you so much. Good luck. Thank you so much. So, uh, yeah, I see 95 people, almost 100. That is totally awesome. I didn't expect to have uh, so many people watching at this late hour on Thursday. Um, and uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Indeed, this is going to be about the role of, of HR. I sort of did a bit of digging around various uh, other presentations and webinars that I've done to see what suggestions that I have specifically for uh, for HR. So, uh, so this is a bit of an experiment, actually, because I don't know if this will be right exactly 45 minutes, but I have a little bit of freedom, as Pablo said. Uh, quite a bit of terrain to cover. So uh, let's see what kind of suggestions I think are relevant for, uh, for HR. Transforming HR and uh, what is the responsibility of HR when it comes to uh, transforming the organization. Um, first of all, let's have a look at some inspiring uh, uh, examples. Well, one specific example, which is Tesla. Everyone knows about the success of Tesla, I suppose. Uh, right now, the value of Tesla uh, a couple of months ago has uh, risen above the value of Toyota, which is amazing because Toyota produces many more cars than Tesla, but in the eyes of shareholders, Tesla is more valuable now. And the most interesting thing, or one of the interesting things I found is that Tesla does not spend any time on advertising, no money, no resources, uh, nothing. They have a completely different way of operating their business. That's fascinating. So they do a couple of things apparently very well. And uh, what is it that they do well? Well, I think uh, what they do well is not only responding to change, but also causing change in the industry. Uh, something that we can learn from, I am pretty sure. You see here these... Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the trend lines of change over time for different technologies. In the past, it lasted for a few decades for a technology to become uh, adopted by the majority of population. Nowadays, with newer technologies, this happens like almost with the flick of a switch. Everyone is using a new technology or a new platform. I remember the first time I heard about TikTok, it turned out that already a billion people were using it. And I was asking, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, that, was, that was a complete surprise uh, to me. 
So these things happen very fast. That is obvious uh, for many of you, I'm pretty sure. Um, and I think HR has an important role to play here in terms of the agile transformation, the digital transformation, multiple kinds of transformation actually that need to happen in organizations to make sure that companies can deal with this amount of change and actually like Tesla also cause the change in their industries to not only respond to disruptors but to be the disruptors in their uh, in their domain I have a number of topics to address uh, experimentation and learning at the business life cycle vision and values and the innovation funnel those are the main topics that I want to cover in the next uh, 40 uh, 45 minutes uh, or so. Let's start with learning uh, and, uh, and experimentation. Um, sometimes I hear people say that we should celebrate failure. And I think that's an interesting suggestion. Should we celebrate failure? Should we say, yay, when somebody just screws up? Uh, personally, I think not. The, it is actually a bit more complicated. Uh, we should learn. We should uh, celebrate. Learning is something that I have um, uh, distilled from the work of Donald Reinertsen. He writes very fascinating but rather complicated books. Uh, I created this picture. I call it the celebration grid. That is sort of the summary of one of uh, one of uh, Donald Reinertsen's books. And uh, basically, he said that we learn the most when we run experiments. When there's a 50-50 chance of uh, failing or succeeding, then we have an optimum amount of learning. We don't learn much when we just repeat good practices, and we don't learn much when we just repeat mistakes. Uh, we learn the most from experiments. That sounds obvious, but uh, it is something that many companies actually are not built for. Uh, they don't celebrate uh, learning usually. So celebrate failure is not a good uh, ter uh, term or not a good um, uh, slogan in my opinion. You should celebrate learning even in the cases when you failed. And that is something that uh, Tesla does very well. It's something that another big company, Amazon, you all know Amazon, it's something that Amazon is really, really good at. Uh, Jeff Bezos is famous for uh, saying that they that the whole point of Amazon is to run as many experiments as they can. Uh, he said uh, you have to experiment when you want to invent. Uh, if you know in advance that something is going to work, it's not an experiment. And most large organizations, they want innovation and invention, but they're unwilling to suffer failure, and that is a problem. That is, I believe, something that HR needs to contribute to, to that culture of embracing learning, even in the cases when you failed. I found a number of examples of Amazon failing. It's actually quite a few examples. Um, Amazon Web Store has failed. Amazon Tickets failed. Um, Amazon Pickup has failed. Amazon Web Pay failed. Uh, Amazon Endless failed. Lots of failures, page after page of failure. But Amazon doesn't care because they learn. And they have a couple of successes that are very, very, uh, that have been very, very successful in generating revenue and to make up for all the failures that they have. Another example, one of my favorites, could, is a Dutch company, uh, Booking.com. Uh, I've been there in Amsterdam at their head office, and I learned that at Booking, they run many, many experiments every day in parallel on their platform. And from their data, it turns out that only 10% of the experiments generate positive results. Imagine that, only 10%. 90% of the experiments fail. That's a lot. But they don't care because the 10% make up for, for everything. So in general, the success rates are low when you run experiments. For every successful experiment, about 3 to 10 will fail. That is, that is quite a lot. And that's the issue when your culture at the company is one of fear of failure. As I said, I think uh, HR has an important role there to address, to make people aware, help them be aware that failure is part of, of learning. Personally, I think we should even stop talking about failure as a word. Um, 
it, it makes me think of that famous term, uh, uh, I am uh, not a crook, uh, the phrase that uh, Nixon once uh, uh, uttered. I am not a crook. Well, the only thing that people heard was crook. And then they associated him with the word crook <laughs> because he said, I am not a crook. So maybe we should stop saying uh, um, uh, celebrate failure or, uh, or um, uh, just not use the word failure at all, but let's say we invest in knowledge. That's what we do. We spend time and energy in running experiments. Experiments is a good word. And all of those are investments in, in knowledge, basically. So we run many exp small experiments, uh, many uh, 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 experiments is less risky than a few big ones. You balance your experiment portfolio is what you can say. That is something that venture capitalists do as well. I will get back to that uh, a bit further on. But one thing that is important, obviously all those experiments need to be safe to fail. Uh, I heard an interesting phrase at Spotify when I was there in, in Stockholm. They say, uh, our experiments need to have a limited blast radius. I like that term. Whenever something explodes, it should be in a small, um, a small area, only a small uh, effect uh, 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 for, every, for every experiment that they, that they run. So that is a safe to fail environment that we need to set up together with the leaders on the teams, with the development managers, uh, product managers, and yes, HR is involved there as well, as far as I'm concerned. So wrapping up that first topic of learning and experimentation, we celebrate learning. Uh, some quotes might be dangerous. Uh, Facebook had a quote that said, uh, or a slogan that said, fail fast, fail early, fail often, or no, sorry, it was uh, move fast and break things. That was the one from Facebook, move fast and break things. Well, turned out that company uh, suffered from, from employees who broke too much. <laughs> you get what you ask for, so Facebook asked people to move fast and break things. Well, breaking things, they did, for sure. So they changed the slogan uh, after a while. Um, I think we should get rid of anything that just mentions failure, because then people just hear the word fail, 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 and that's not good. What we want is cheap experimentation, safe and fast. Those are good words. Experiment in a way that is cheap, that is safe, and that is fast. That is uh, what, uh, uh, what we want. Stop using the word failure as far as I'm concerned. Now, that is the first message that I want to give to HR managers. What is that that you can do to help the company have this culture of experimentation, where it is OK for people to try things and knowing that nine out of 10 things will not succeed. There will be uh, uh, investments in knowledge, uh, basically. Next part, the business life cycle is another uh, part that I believe uh, HR has a very important role. This is a story, uh, this is a photo of, of my uh, younger years. This is when I was 10 years old, more or less, I think. This is me, uh, my parents, uh, my younger brother and my younger sister. Um, and uh, I remember when uh, we were about that age that my brother complained to my mom that he thought it was unfair that I was allowed to come home anytime I wanted in the evenings, but he had to be home at six. That was not fair, he said. Well, my mother said, uh, maybe the reason is because Jürgen is three years older. He is in a different life cycle stage. When you get older, when you are are as old as he is now, you will probably have the same rules. My mother was smart and she knew that you need to treat kids uh, it, differently depending on, on their level of maturity, where they are in their, in their human life cycle. I think the same applies to businesses, to business units, to products. Um, I have. I don't have time to go through all the life cycle stages. I have other webinars for that in case you're interested. But in general, I distinguish 10 stages from the earliest idea to the retirement of a product. The first stages are all about exploring a new business idea, a new product, maybe with minimal viable products and lean experimentation and business model canvases. And near the end, it is 
mainly execution, just making money. Uh, uh, first, it is trying to do the right thing, and then later it is doing that thing right. Now, what is important is that the maturity of that product, of that business model, changes over time, and also the risk changes over time. In the early stages, the biggest risk for that product is no traction. That means nobody wants to use it. That is the biggest challenge for startups, the, to, to create a product that people want to use. That is their, their, the biggest risk, that they're making something that nobody wants to use. As I know from my own experience, that is super, super hard. Pro startups usually call that product market fit, making a product that fits the market. Early evidence that the business model works. That's the early risk. And then a few stages later, you get to growth. Then the biggest risk in the middle is that things are not growing. You have to make sure that, that what you can do at a small scale can also uh, uh, um, grow larger and, and scale to a large number of people. And then in the later stages, obviously, the biggest risk is that you're not being profitable anymore. Because by that time, competitors come in and they copy what you do, but they may be doing it more uh, cheaply. So uh, profits then matter very much. I have a picture of the iPod sales over time uh, by Apple uh, from 2002 all the way to 2014. You can see the life cycle of that product. It, it, it started around here. That was product market fit, the early stages, and scaling up. I call that stage six, basically, and profitable cornering the market, that is stage seven, and then stage eight is midlife crisis of the product, and then stage nine and ten, it dies at some point. That's a very normal life cycle of any product, any service. Sometimes this takes a few years, sometimes it can take a hundred years, but every product starts up, scales up, and then screws up at some point. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a normal life cycle of a, of a business model. I, I have workshops every now and then, and then I ask people to come up with typical practices. Where does which practice sit in that, in that life cycle stage? And people are full of ideas, and they say, well, minimal viable products are typically stage three and four, and growth hacking is typically stage six when the company, when the business is scaling up. And then um, uh, strict rules and policies from, from uh, management is typically for stage seven and eight because then we need to s stay profitable and we need to aim for efficiency and things like that. So the wall is then full of, of behaviors that basically change over time. I'll give you one concrete example. I heard about OKRs many, many times at Agile conferences. It's a quite popular concept. Uh, popularized by Google, uh, picked up from Intel, um, a new goal-setting framework, basically, uh, that works better than traditional management by objectives. So far, so good. I love the, the framework as well. It is full of good suggestions. The only thing that I noticed is, in all my conversations around Europe with various startups and early scale-ups, nobody talked about OKRs. They all talked about the North Star metric which is a different goal-setting paradigm. It's much simpler. What is the one metric, the single metric, that our self-organizing team should organize themselves around? The one metric could be the monthly recurring revenue, or it could be total order size per customer, or something. doesn't matter. The North Star can change every few months, but there should be laser focus of the self-organizing team on one thing. That tends to be a goal-setting practice for startups. It works well because it offers a startup a laser focus, as I said, but it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale to 100,000 people. So I thought, well, that makes sense if you, if you think of a, a business evolving over its lifetime, going through different life cycle stages, and in the early years, when it is still a kid among the business models, when it does mostly exploration, then, yeah, the North Star metric makes a lot of sense. But as soon as it starts scaling up, 
the North Star metric doesn't work anymore. Then you need something more professional, more, more scalable, which is OKRs. So like my brother noticing that the rules are different for his older brother, I think the same applies to business units and products. The rules should be different uh, depending on the product that people work for. And this, I think, is a key insight for HR. People throughout the company should not be a force to all live up to the same rules. There should not be some kind of a policy that just simply applies to everyone because that could kill the business. I repeat, if you have uh, the same policies for everyone in the whole company, you might be killing the company. Because what the startups need, what the kids among the business need, that could be very different from the ones that are grown ups. The grown-ups are the ones who make the money. They have, it's very important that they are efficient, that they don't waste their money on, on tr trivial things. So, yeah, you may have expense forms and things like that. But for startups, expense forms make no sense at all. For, for a startup business, you just give them a budget and say, everything that you do comes out of the budget and you decide for yourself how you spend it. Uh, that's how startups work, basically. Uh, so depending on the policies, you have to wonder to for which business units is this a reasonable policy? What we expect from the adult business units should not apply automatically also to the kids and vice versa. Now, that is something I believe HR needs to think about. How can we differentiate between the different units that we have? And the young ones, the kids among the business units that are still in exploration mode, they should know that maybe they have some freedoms that will disappear once they grow up because then they join the other adults and then the same policies are going to apply that the others are already uh, uh, using. So that's the business life cycle. Well, I believe uh, HR can make a big, uh, big difference by not automatically treating everyone in the whole company the same, but treating people depending on what business unit, what product they are working on and understanding what the maturity is of that product and that business model. The third topic where I think HR can make a difference in terms of transforming, uh, transforming the organization um, that's um, uh, vision and values. Uh, an important topic, and I'm sure many of you know what visions and values are all about. Vision is, is about where is it worth going, in what direction should we take the company. Values is uh, how do we get there safely. What, is the, what are the behaviors that are acceptable or, or, or desirable in order to get, to get there? And uh, it is a fact that a clarity of vision and values brings motivation and productivity among employees. There's plenty of research, uh, research uh, con uh, confirming this. Um, vision, a massive transformative purpose, moonshots, uh, big, hairy, audacious goals. There are various terms for vision. Um, uh, I'm not going to explain how to create a vision that is something that the leaders need to do uh, i am doing it right now with with a drawing and actually today i was in envisioning mode with uh, for my team because tomorrow uh, afternoon i will be having a vision session with them so i'll be explaining for them what my vision is and i'm drawing it because i think drawings for me work well but for others it could be a photo it could be a story doesn't matter that much but at least you can't need to come up with with a why, something that inspires people. That is the direction that you want to send the organization uh, in. But then the values, that is a, a very fascinating topic in my opinion. One uh, 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 author who is much more famous than I am, Patrick Lencioni, wrote a number of books and I think he has the best uh, uh, overview of values that I have so far. Come, uh, 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 come across uh, the four categories of, of values. Many companies talk about the core values. Um, uh, Lencioni says that's actually one category of, of values. The core values are the values that come naturally to you, that 
that describe basically who you are as a business. Like for example, I am a very open person. I often uh, am transparent about what I think. I uh, my, my 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 brain is usually just flowing out of my mouth. <laughs> sometimes even in offensive ways as i've noted but that's just that's how i am i just say whatever i think that's a core value the openness and transparency on the other hand i also have aspirational values like i could be more empathic i know that i am not uh, very socially aware sometimes of what is going on around me that takes me effort to be more uh, empathic towards other people. So that is aspirational value. I would love to be like that. So there are two categories of values. Then there's a third category Lencioni describes uh, in his books. He says those are the accidental values. They simply emerge, but nobody has planned them. Like for example, I worked at a company where most of the people that were hired were young male students. And young male students are at least at that company, they were into gaming, sports, and alcohol. So games and sports and alcohol became a thing in our company. They played lots of games, foosballs, game nights, and, and whatever. There was alcohol after office hours because that's the kind of people that we hired. There was nothing wrong with that, um, but it was accidental. It was not planned. So this became an accidental value, basically, because people valued those uh, those things. And the last category is permission to play. Those are the values that basically society expects from us, right? Uh, like non-discrimination, integrity, things like that. They may not be part of our core. Uh, sometimes we may not. They may not be aspirational, but you. They are like the minimum benchmark uh, of of values that you need to have in place. Um, I have uh, eight rules that I came up with, with a bit of uh, digging around, and I believe HR has a super important role to play here, to make sure that these values, the behaviors of people, because that's what we're talking about, are in line with uh, what we expect, uh, how, we how we want culture to be in the organization, and help us to move safely in the, in the direction where we want people to end up. First of all, you um, need to make yourself special. Uh, it, uh, Patrick Lancioni wrote in his work that 55% of companies have integrity as part of their values. 55% have integrity. I think that's bullshit. Sorry to use the word. Because <laughs> most companies, have, when, it, when push comes to shove, they have no integrity whatsoever. The revenue is usually the most important thing. That is perhaps something that is expected from society to have integrity, but it's not a core core value. What you should have as value is something that makes you different from, from other companies that few other companies have as a value, something that makes you seem special, that makes people want to work for you as a, as a company, that make you stand out. So that's the first one, make yourself special with the values that you pick. The second, keep it all meaningful. Um, it, only, it is only a value when it hurts. Like um, when you say we are a company with integrity, but at the same time, the company needs to bribe officials in some faraway country to gain market share. Well, then apparently we have no integrity, right? Then market share and revenue take priority over integrity. So integrity has no meaning. Values need to hurt. If integrity is important for you, then you're not bribing officials that should be uh, or could be the result. So values sometimes need to hurt, otherwise they are meaningless. Values need to be picked together. One mistake that many companies make, uh, as I learned, is that, that uh, surveys are sent around to people, sometimes by HR, uh, by HR people, sometimes by leaders, where everyone is asked for their input. Well, that is interesting, but the core players, the founders, the, the people who have been working there for years, who know the company inside out, they should come up with the values and not the intern who was there for only two months. She might have some suggestions, but they're not the kind of people to determine the core values. I have my own list I created a number of years ago as part of the Managing for Happiness book. Uh, 
I believe 200 of values or something. It's a great to do to use as an exercise in case you need some some inspiration. Um, rule number four: Show what is expected. Always lead by example. Sounds obvious, but many companies don't do this. I was in a conversation once with a CEO who wanted everyone to be more disciplined. Uh, fair enough, but because there was no discipline in the company. But whenever we had a meeting with him he was 20 minutes late he had no discipline either so they say a fish rots from the head down as a leader you need to show what is expected from everyone else and then this is important for hr weave the values in the value should be everywhere the value should be part of the hiring process the value should be part of the of the promotions and the rewards of the evaluation process uh, uh, in, even for the, the uh, uh, for when when you fire people, it could be because of values that they have not uh, uh, adhered to. So this is <clears throat> important uh, one for HR, maybe the most important of the eight. And then six, and encourage people speaking out, make it easy to share the good and the bad examples of of uh, values. When there's bad. When there are bad things going on, uh, people need to know where they can report it. HR needs to make sure that there is a box somewhere, an email address, a person that they, they can trust, that they can go to for any kind of concern when there is misbehavior uh, taking place in the organization. It must be crystal clear where people can go for their for any confidential uh, issues. But at the same time, much uh, maybe even more important, encourage people to speak out about the good stuff, the great things that are happening, because you need to shine the spotlight on the good behaviors. Of course, the kudo box that I popularized uh, with my, my early work is a great example of that. You write tokens of appreciation, kudo cards, that you then share with everyone. And if you, if you want to do it well, you might even want to list the values on the kudo cards so that people can tick them off. Like, I thank you for helping me out with this because that ticks off the value of whatever collaboration or, or uh, anything that you might have on your values list. All right, almost there. Seven is reward and discourage. Uh, when people report all these stories, the good stories and the bad stories, leadership needs to do something with this. And of course, HR can help there as well. The good stuff needs to be celebrated. The bad things need to be addressed. Um, one quote that I uh, picked up a number of years ago is, the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. So if you have bad things happening and you do not intervene, that bad behavior will become the baseline, basically, of your organization's culture. Of course, what you want to have uh, is uh, the culture of any organization shaped by the best behavior the leader is willing to amplify, right? So shine the spotlight on the good stuff that is, uh, that is happening, more often than addressing the bad things. I have once suggested a bell, ring the bell for anything that is going on that is worth celebrating. I did that a number of years ago at one of the companies where I worked uh, and it worked really well. There were cookies and cake whenever somebody rang the bell, when there was something to celebrate. Last but not least, practice storytelling. Now you have all those stories, you have those examples of good behaviors and bad behaviors, collect them. Collect them in a culture book, collect them in videos and, and repeat them at, at annual events, uh, sh share them when you hire new people, for example. Be transparent about what had happened before and how you dealt with that. Some companies turn that into a culture code book. Uh, you can find those on LinkedIn uh, with the culture code hashtag. To be honest, many of the slide decks are actually just marketing efforts where companies just pretend that they're really cool to work for, but I'm sure some of them are genuine uh, uh, and, and really fantastic companies to, uh, to work for. Uh, so my point is the culture code should be an outcome of everything you have done before, the other seven uh, uh, rules basically that I list here again, all the way from making yourself special uh, to practicing storytelling. 
and a useful template perhaps for you to use when you discuss values with your leadership would be this one uh, the values the core values on the one hand that come naturally to you the wish values or the aspirational that you would like to have and then on um, those are from yourself and then from the outside world is whatever employees come up with emergent accidental and what the outside world expects uh, from uh, from you so that was vision of values i have one more topic uh, to discuss what i believe uh, hr can make uh, can really make a difference and that is the innovation funnel and then ultimately everything uh, will wrap together with the final model that i'm going to show you because it all leads up to something i promise <laughs> All right, the innovation funnel. Um, I was once part of an innovation steering committee because the company wanted to be more innovative and we had an idea box and people submitted ideas to the idea box, but nothing ever happened, to be honest. Uh, I was looking at the ideas with my fellow uh, CXOs. I was CIO and there was a COO and a C CTO and we looked at the ideas and we said, nah, this is not going to work. And then we, we threw the ideas away and we basically, we did not accept any of the ideas because we were scared. We were actually scared to commit to any of the, of the ideas. Uh, and in hindsight, that was the wrong approach. That is not how innovation works. Uh, the better approach is, uh, is explained with this metaphor uh, by, by Robert Cooper. The first thing to remember is, is it's a bit like playing poker. Uh, when you sit down at the poker table and you start betting, you don't put all your money on the table. You put maybe $2 or two euros and you get a few cards and then you bet a little bit more money and you, and you get a few more cards and, and more information. In other words, new product projects, you never bet all the money at the beginning. It's a stepwise process. It's an incremental commitment. As you learn more, you bet more. So Robert Cooper says, he used a very nice metaphor of playing poker. You don't bet all the money in the beginning. And that was what we were afraid of as innovation committee. We were afraid that when we accept an idea that we would have to invest that idea, uh, invest in that idea uh, until the completion of the product. But he says it doesn't work like that. First, you give every idea a little bit of money like playing poker, just a few dollars, a few euros, and then you get a bit of information. And then when it turns out well, you give it a bit more. So it is like a game. Uh, it is like an, uh, levels that you climb. It's almost like Donkey Kong or, or like Game of Thrones. Every season of Game of Thrones, uh, fewer families were left until the last season when there was uh, only a couple of contestants for the Iron Throne, if you remember well. So uh, it's the same idea. You start with many and then iteration by iteration, more and more drop out. What you need to do is they, they, those ideas need to collect information with what they call in startup language, problem solution fit, product market fit, business market fit, etc. So you give them a little bit of money and if they do things well, you give them a little bit more, etc. That is actually how the whole startup scene works. And this is what I believe HR can also help. Because at many companies, they already do a great thing. They have hackathons, innovation days. That would be the first step, basically, where people are asked to come up with great ideas. What could we do? How can we innovate? Does anyone have a great suggestion for a new product? But what happens after the hackathon? Many companies have no answer to that. They have no follow-up after the hackathon. But you need to have a program in place. You need to have a game, basically, the second round and the third round, and the budgets get bigger and bigger, depending on the evidence that the, uh, that the, uh, the products have uh, collected, that those startup units have been able to, uh, to find. A couple of suggestions that I found earlier at other companies, uh, some have, some apply internal crowdfunding, for example, where the employees can vote on their favorite ideas and uh, that knowledge, the wisdom of the crowd is then used to reward the best ideas who then make it to the next round and uh, the ones who vote correctly, uh, 
they might, might ultimately end up with a return on their investment, their virtual euros or virtual dollars, basically, uh, in the form of presents or extra vacation days, whatever. But you tap into the knowledge of the crowd, the wisdom of the crowd, basically, with internal crowdfunding among the employees. That's a, a great idea. Another idea that you can steal from the startup scene is having demo days. Just have them come up and show their stuff. Show what you can do literally on stage. Do you have traction? Do you have retention? What is the evidence that you have that your product is going to work? If you don't have evidence, you drop out and the others will continue to the next, to the next round. And obviously, you're going to need innovation scorecards. Investors have scorecards, so the company will also need scorecards that you use to get those ideas to the next round. It's very much the same as a recruitment process with scorecards of, of job candidates, only this time you apply it to ideas, innovative ideas. And then there's metered funding also, quite no normal in the startup scene, the bigger uh, the further they get into the funnel, the bigger the budgets, uh, basically. That is what metered funding uh, means. Here's another metaphor. It sounded like two three-year-olds who've got flu trying to sing. So Simon Cowell is not very nice in his comments. <laughs> much better insults than, than I can come up with. But this would be an innovation board 3.0, you could say. They, they don't know at the start who is going to win, but they have stages. They have a game. Everyone can start, but the further they get, the fewer candidates remain until at the end you will have a winner. And that is a very normal process in any kind of domain, how to get from many ideas to the, the few best ones. Two or three things more that you need, and then I'm going to wrap up. Uh, you need an executive sponsor. You need somebody on the management team who is going to support this transformation, who is going to support this new innovative approach to generating ideas. If you want to be like Tesla, if you want to be like Amazon, you need to have your innovation process in place, your innovation game, uh, basically. Run many experiments. You know that only a few will actually make it. The others will be knowledge investments. They will die, but that's okay. It is part of the, it's part of the game. Somebody needs to be the sponsor of that. You also need like corporate venturing. You invest in your own ideas and you know that most will fail, but some will, uh, will succeed. Very similar to how venture capitalists work. And you'll probably need strategic buckets, like so much of our money we put in the high risk projects and so much in the low risk projects. Any investor knows that you need to balance your budget, portfolio management, that is called. Investors do exactly the same thing. You mix the high risk and the low risk ideas. And then you get something like this, where the main revenue, the main results all come from, from the top 5% of the, of the ideas or the products and the rest they generate almost nothing uh, basically, but these pay for everyone uh, uh, ultimately. So you make many small bets, the greatest risk is not taking any risks at all because then your company will die for sure. So the final model will come now, uh, venturing you do in the beginning, optimizing you do at the end. This is where you explore in the early stages. This is where you execute in the later stages. And when we turn it a bit sideways, it looks like this. You have startup ideas, lots of suggestions from hackathons that uh, make it to next stages. Fewer and fewer will remain the further they get just like in the startup scene. And then once they grow up, once they start scaling up, they join the adults. And this is important for HR. HR needs to contribute to transforming the organization per stage, per business unit, basically. Because different business units need to be treated in different ways. You do not treat the adults who need to make money, who need to be profitable, the same way as the kids over here. They need to explore, they need to play. Nine out of 10 will die, but that is normal. That is part of, of innovation. That is part of the whole transformation of the company. You need to have 
a, a different approach depending on where the units are with different policies, uh, different ways of, of management and different compensation probably. And then you will embrace the evolution of the business because the young ones, they will at some point take over from the older ones and the older ones, they will die at some point. And that is perfectly normal in a family of business units and business uh, models. Think of Apple. Apple does exactly this. Apple is not defined by one product. Apple is a family of product that all are linked to each other. But while one is uh, in midlife crisis, another one is growing up and new ones are being born. And this just go keeps going on and on in an endless, endless cycle. So that were the four areas where I believe HR can make a difference. Uh, make sure that people can experiment and learn. Uh, get the word failure out of your dictionary, basically. They are knowledge investments. Um, make sure that your policies are checked for whether or not they are really applicable to everyone. Maybe you should distinguish between different units, different products, different business units and say, well, these kinds of forms only make sense to those that are trying to be profitable. But these forms and these policies only apply to the ones who are innovating and learning. It should be different. Don't treat the kids as adults and vice versa. With vision and values, uh, this is all about how to create the culture with the right behaviors, with the rewards, and yes, the punishments every now and then. It is part of, of, of uh, growing up and uh, uh, becoming a mature uh, business to learn how to behave uh, well in a healthy way and getting everyone safely in the direction where you want them uh, to end up. And ultimately, the innovation funnel. Uh, what can HR do in order to get that whole game of business where lots of new ideas start? Uh, what can HR do to organize this? I think there are many contributions that you can all make uh, in collaboration with the management team, uh, obviously, and the executives. So that was uh, those were my suggestions for the role of HR in the digital transformation, in the agile transformation. Uh, at, uh, uh, at large and small companies. Um, if you found some of these things interesting, when you want to have some downloads of, uh, of PDFs uh, of various practices, then uh, go over here to the shift up dash sign up, uh, uh, sorry, bit.ly uh, slash shift up dash sign up, because there are a number of uh, templates that I have where you can practice with these things, with the business model life cycle, for example, uh, and, um, uh, the uh, uh, the canvas for values uh, will become available very soon. I share all those through the Shift Up program, including two chapters of my of my book, Startup Scale Up Screw Up. All right, that's it. Uh, I am only one minute over time. I think I did a decent job there, but that's and that's for you to decide. I will stop sharing my screen and uh, see if there are any questions. So I will happily hand it over to the moderators, to Raquel. All right, Raquel, back to you. Thank you, Jorgen, for sharing these ideas with us. I especially like the accidental venues concept. I think it's really powerful for, for cultural growth and transformation. And yes, of course, we have many questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if there will be time for all of them. Uh, but if not, if um, if there are interesting questions and attendees uh, are interested, we can stay a few minutes after 6 p.m. We so will see how far we get. Yeah. There's no problem. Are you ready? Yeah. Go okay. ahead. You pick the questions. The first one. Carlos asks, you mentioned many times HR as being responsible for the mindset. Don't you think HR is not enough uh, to implement the mindset? Is, uh, is it more a manager's or leadership concern, uh, wherever depth it is? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I said that HR is responsible for the mindset. I think that HR can contribute. There's an important difference, right? Uh, yes, um, of course, the leadership is uh, are the main ones who are responsible for the culture. Uh, as I said, uh, the fish rots from the head down. That means it starts with the CEO. The CEO needs to 
lead by example, to walk the talk, as they say in English. But HR has a very important role to play, in my opinion, because HR is involved in performance evaluations and recruitment, usually in, in firing people. So they are very often the sparring partner of management and leadership. And uh, HR can remind the leader that these are the important things that we want to test people, uh, people against. So uh, yeah, I, I think HR can contribute, but mm -hmm. they're not the main ones who are responsible for, um, uh, for that. Of course, I agree with you. Interesting, there we go with the next one. Mariana asks about vision and values. How could you make leaders responsible and commit, more commit, I, I understand, for cultural transformation through values? Could you give us some advices? Wow. Um, well, I think the best thing to do um, would be to share examples of their competitors, of the companies that do better than, <laughs> than, than they do. Because usually, as the data has shown, those companies are the ones with a great vision and a great organizational culture. Uh, and uh, that is something we need to be inspired by. If we want to be as successful as a Tesla or an Amazon or whatever company in your own domain, then, then be inspired by how they run their business. And I am pretty sure you will find that they have a better vision, a better organization of culture, and the culture stems from uh, uh, defined values that you embrace uh, together. So uh, it can be that leadership is not very interested in having a discussion around values per se, but they are often very interested in a discussion about the competition. Mm -hmm. Why is it that the competition does better than we do? Well. Um, uh, you can make a compelling case that this is partly, uh, and the data confirms this, there are Harvard Business Review articles, etc., and, and, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, research that I saw, uh, that confirm that the performance of a company is correlated with a compelling purpose, vision, and organizational culture. Just offer that data. Okay, thank you, Jurgen. I think that's the challenge, isn't it? It's always a challenge convincing someone else of your opinion. Sure, I do not have the golden, mm -hmm. the, 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 the golden bullet or the silver bullet, I, I mean, for that. But you can try starting with the competition. What, is, what are leaders interested in? That's usually uh, beating the competition. So start there. What is it that competitors do? So, so while Raquel actually serves for another question, I have uh, I have one of my, uh, my question of myself, uh, Jurgen. So, as you know, many transformation has started in organizations by uh, technology operations, and in the best cases, maybe from the business. So it's uh, not actually quite normal to see transformation started from HR department or people areas. So what what have you seen in the market? Have you seen this this trend and is the right trend or should actually uh, HR or people areas catch up with that with that trend? Well, I think you have a good point. Uh, usually uh, uh, the organization transformation starts elsewhere. This year we've seen it because of a virus, <laughs> because mm -hmm. of the pandemic. There has been no greater uh, uh, push on companies than, uh, than this year with the need to work remotely, uh, uh, for example. Um, and then HR just needs to respond uh, to the new situation. I just talked today about the consequences of people working at home and some people do not have the right equipment at home and they get they don't have the right chairs and everything so they get pain everywhere and then what do you do as as hr you you basically deal with a situation that is pushed onto you i think that is usually the case with with agile transformation this tends uh, tends to you start and at the it department but then IT says uh, we cannot change just by ourselves. We need marketing and finance and HR to change as well. Otherwise, we can never satisfy our customers in the way that we need. So then again, HR comes comes after together with the other 
parts of the business. I have rarely seen or heard that the change, the transformation itself is initiated by HR. It would be nice, it would be awesome. <laughs> uh, hopefully some people listening here and uh, or attending this webinar are the ones who are causing a change instead of just responding. But I don't think it makes much of a difference as long as you are aligned. I don't care if you're the first or the second or the third in the company. If you believe in the same thing as HR, you say, yeah, we believe we need to contribute there. We need to make sure that IT can do their stuff. We need to make sure that people are healthy at home, uh, that we walk fully in on this agile and digital and remote working transformation. Uh, who cares if they came first or second or third? You just have to contribute to making it happen. And HR has a very important role. That's for sure. Thank you, Jürgen. Raquel, more questions? We have another five minutes, at least. Yes, yeah, sure. I have, I have many here. One uh, from Adrian regarding diversity and also um, the pandemic you, you mentioned before. How can we boost diversity and inclusion in times where remote working is becoming a, a common practice? Um, hmm, great, great question. Well, there are practices uh, for that. Like, for example, um, uh, it's not much different from, from uh, working uh, in a co-located way. If you, for example, have um, a, a group of people discussing a topic, then very often is the extroverts who voice their opinions first and the introverts remain silent uh, and only answer questions when they are asked. There are techniques for that, like uh, brain writing, for example, as opposed to brainstorming. With brain writing, you ask everyone in the group to first write their ideas on sticky notes, and then at the same time, they offer them to the group. That levels the playing field between the extroverts and, uh, and the introverts to make sure that everyone is heard to the same extent. I think there's not much difference within remote working. Uh, for sure, some people who are digital natives uh, who who who, uh, uh, who like using the new, the new technologies for remote working they might dominate discussions but if you have a good facilitator who knows how to get everyone's opinion get everyone's insights that facilitator should be able to for example first uh, uh, solicit for input from every person in in a group uh, regardless of how well they deal with technologies, regardless of how, if they're introverts or extroverts, make sure that we have everyone's input, put it for, uh, make it available for everyone to share, and then discuss it as a, as a group. That applies to diversity and inclusion, but any other uh, other topic. This just it's a facilitation technique. Uh, so most people are bad at it, but with a bit of practice, you become better and better at making sure that that everyone is heard. Uh, at the same to the same extent otherwise indeed some people will dominate the the discussion so raquel while you you search another question i have here another one edgardo jurgen ask uh, in your opinion jurgen uh, who uh, would be the best suit uh, to develop the company vision and values management or the board of directors um, well, they say uh, the founders, <laughs> and I don't know where the founders are. The founders could be among the board of directors, and the founders could be among the management team. It depends per company. But those, you start with those who came first, those who had the first idea of a business. Like with Hewlett Packard, it was Hewlett and Packard, <laughs> the founders of the business. That's where the business came from. It was their idea for the company. It's the same for for. But Patagonia, I don't remember the name of the, the of the founder, but he had a vision for 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 making making outdoor clothing in a way that is sustainable and that respects nature and never damage nature with our tools. He had a vision there, and he is the right person where it, the discussion starts. Of course, others can then bring the discussion further. But usually that's where it begins. Same with Jeff Bezos. Uh, he's, uh, I don't care if Jeff Bezos is a CEO or, or a director or, or, or whatever. He's the founder. That's where 
where it starts uh, usually. And um, uh, but you also want to include the people who were there from the very early beginnings, who came, who were like employees two, three, four, and five. <laughs> they know so much about what happened before. They know the company's soul and the the pain that the company has gone through and the the victories. Uh, they have all the stories. You really want those people involved in in, in vision and values. Thank you, Jürgen. So, Raquel, maybe just uh, one more question and we, we wrap up. Cool. I have one here. Maybe uh, probably many attendees uh, are thinking about this this question or, or this topic. Uh, it's regarding uh, the reward strategy for a company. Do you have uh, any advice how to balance between collective rewarding and individual rewarding uh, of people or how HR can contribute to that or how rewarding strategy uh, needs to be changed? Mm, that's a great question and one that I have not one single clear answer to. Um, I, um, I do believe, first of all, people have individual contracts you never hire people collectively as a group, right? You hire them individually, you fire them individually. That means you also pay them individually. So that ultimately you need a per person compensation that is fair to the person. However, the performance of the person depends on their interaction with other people. And very often the perspectives and opinions of other people are very interesting to determine the level of compensation uh, for someone. So yeah, I think ultimately it is uh, a person's manager who should determine the individual compensation of a person, but that manager should definitely take into account any 360 degree input from around that person, um, adding all the pluses and the minuses and the different perspectives. Um, and uh, there are, you can even use some some gamified uh, uh, systems such as merit money that I have suggested with management 3.0 where people give each other points and the points are translated to bonuses basically but then I sh still suggest to keep that a relatively small component of the larger compensation that you need to decide upon as a as a manager with the individual uh, employee but for uh, for sure you need the the opinion of the system around a person to determine what that individual compensation is i don't believe in collective compensation because as i said the people are hired individually they are fired individually so they will need an individual uh, uh, discussion with their with their manager excellent so yeah. Again, we have been very inspiring with uh, with your conversation, with your talk. I would really to thank you so much thank for participating so much. in this talent event and helping us uh, spreading agile practices and mindset around the globe. I want to thank also Raquel uh, for the moderation of the event and, of course, all the people that have joined us today in this conference. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Goodbye and stay tuned. All right. Thank you, too. Thanks for the invites. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.